Radio across the UK, online, on DAB, and on your smart speaker. The Unexplained with Howard Hughes on Talk Radio. Talk Radio. Radio. In the midnight hour, um, meet Norway's Teddy A. G. Simonson, who's told the history of paranormality in a new 500-page book out, uh, I think, this week from Watkins Publishers. You can connect with us anytime on 0344 499 um, at Talk Radio by Twitter or text Talk and then a space to your, uh, your uh, text to 87222. So, get set for resourcefully rapid-fire rollercoaster randomised reality radio for a Sunday night. This is The Unexplained, Dateline, October the 25th, 2020. The Unexplained, with Howard Hughes. Talk Radio. The Unexplained, with Howard Hughes, on Talk Radio. And the Unexplained hits midnight. I'm Howard Hughes. Thank you very much for all of your communications. Wherever you are, you can always email me through my website, theunexplained.tv. And at the moment, I am about six weeks, maybe seven, maybe eight weeks from my 500th podcast. And I'm looking for your ideas on what I can feature in that 500 podcast. I've had a few already, including one really good suggestion that I would never have come up with. Uh, But we'll see where we go with that. So go to the website, theunexplained.tv, and just put in the subject line, 500th podcast. Uh, Because I'm trying to come up with ideas. And I need yours, basically. Right, um, we're going to talk about something different this time. Um, A book I suppose I could call a bit of a compendium. It is um, a collection of information that basically charts the history of paranormality. And I mean all of it. It is a 500-page book. And the man who's written this book and done the research, which must have taken a heck of a long time uh, behind it, is uh, Teddy A. uh, Simonsen in Norway, Teddy A. G. Simonsen in the south of Norway. Um, All I know about him is that he used to teach at Oslo University, but nowadays he writes on subjects like this, which I think makes him even more intriguing. Teddy A., thank you very much. I know you heard all of that. How are you? Well, I'm quite fine, Howard. Thanks a lot for having me on the show. My pleasure. Um, It's been a while since we've connected with Norway. I think you're in the south of Norway, are you? Yes, uh, a little uh, southern town called Mandal, uh, quite close to Kristiansand. Oh, right. Okay. And what uh, is it famous? Well, apart from yourself, is it famous for anything? Uh, well, it used to be quite a lot of famous painters here in the old time, perhaps because of the beautiful light, something like Cornwall in Britain, I, I would suppose, you know. Yeah, no, it's, you know, that part of Norway I would love to explore. And especially at this time of year, although I'm sure it can be very cold, I'm sure the air is clear. And I'm sure when you look up in the sky, uh, you see some amazing sights there. Well, yeah, it happens. <laughs> Okay. Well, look, uh, I tried to describe you, and I didn't do very well. So how would you describe yourself, Terry? Well, uh, my education is as a historian of ideas, and I have specialized in the esoteric uh, and the occult. You know, Kabbalah, Sufism, Hermitism, uh, Occultism, uh, Golden Dawn, and all this kind of uh, fringe uh, movements that has been uh, part of, um, uh, say, uh, religions, but uh, the secret part of uh, the different religions. Okay. Esotericism, yes. And are all of those things, you know, I suspect they are for a whole variety of reasons, but all of are those things uh, popular in Norway? Well, yes, there's quite a great milieu, but, you know, people are more into the modern, uh, say, uh, brand of these things in the form of new age, going to healing seminars and going to psychics and uh, uh, alternative therapies and that kind. I have been more into the historical, uh, you know, perhaps a bit more scientific, uh, which has been a part of the European esoteric and also the European philosophical tradition. So uh, a bit, I'm not into the latest fad into the 
alternative things. I'm more into, say, classical uh, occultism and also into modern parapsychology. Okay, now the book seems to me to be a bit of a roadmap for how we got to the understanding of, of the paranormal and parapsychology that we have today. Is that what you set out to do? Uh, yes, I would say so. I would. Uh, it is a description of how important the paranormal has been in the European tradition. Because today, uh, if you are a scientist, uh, you uh, revise your eyebrow, uh, eyebrows if someone uh, of your colleagues uh, started to talk about this phenomena. But, you know, in the traditional European history of science and philosophy, this phenomena has had their uh, place. And also with some philosopher, quite important important place. And uh, interestingly enough, uh, in modern physics, uh, especially some quantum physicists um, have taken up that uh, relay button and uh, say that uh, if you have a right understanding or correct understanding of a consciousness, uh, these uh, phenomena are not uh, unexplainable at all, but is somehow very rational and a part of, say, a modern picture of the world. And indeed, and, uh, you, you chart the stories of many people, and we'll go through some of them uh, in this yes. book, uh, you know, the, the stories of those people and how they came to that conclusion that, well, some of them came to that conclusion that these things that we believe are paranormal may in fact be just uh, something to do with the way that our brains work, an aspect of consciousness, perhaps something like a a global internet of mind where everybody is connected, which I know, and we will talk about this, things like remote viewing and you know, ESP come into play. Exactly. And uh, my, if there is a message in the book, I would say that is to make people aware of this collective dimension of consciousness. Because usually by thinking inside the box, we say uh, that uh, consciousness is just something I have inside my head or you have inside your head. Uh, but that is like saying uh, that internet is inside my mobile phone. That is not correct. Uh, internet is between all the mobile phones and all, between, uh, all the PCs. And my view of consciousness is that is also a collective thing. It's a web uh, where all, say, uh, individual consciousness uh, connect. Uh, and that is what I call the, the mental internet. Uh, and if you view consciousness that way, which some interpretations of quantum physics uh, certainly allow for, uh, then these phenomena will find uh, a quite natural uh, uh, and, say, rational place. Hmm, and we're coming to more and more understand these things uh, with every passing year. I wonder if I can just ask you quickly about something else before we start about uh, start on about the book. Um, yes, of course. Because the book actually mentions this person, but towards the end, and he's been in the news this week. Uh, we've talked about him a little earlier in this show. James Randi, uh, the magician, and I guess you could call him, I've called him anyway for years, the debunker in chief. Uh, yes. This was the man, of course, in America um, who offered famously a million dollar a prize if anybody could prove to his satisfaction and to the satisfaction and repeatability of science that any paranormal phenomenon exists and mm -hmm. the the prize uh, for all of his years and he died this week at the age of 92 that million dollar prize remained unclaimed didn't it Yes, it did. Uh, uh, he become a kind of um, what is called in in English uh, pensionist when he retired uh, in uh, 2015, and then uh, the prize was uh, discontinued. Uh, but I have a chapter in my book about that prize, and you know, M M Randy was a magician, and uh, when you deal with magicians, they are very likely to trick you. That is <laughs> kind of their trade. So. Uh, if you see, uh, go closely into the conditions for that price, it is no wonder that it was unclaimed. I can go into this uh, in some detail if you want, but basically uh, there were conditions there that was not, uh, I would say, it was clo close impossible to, to, to satisfy to, because there was a clause in, in the contract that said if he did not agree 
uh, with the result somehow it would not be been uh, uh, deemed valid. And of course, if his life works and uh, a million dollar was at stake, it, I feel it will uh, be very difficult for him to somehow mm. agree to th- that th- this and that uh, phenomena have uh, been proved. Well, th- there were a couple of things going on. You suggest that nobody really took this prize seriously. And then there was whether the prize would actually be paid if anybody could demonstrate it, which we have to stress nobody ever really did. Um, in fact, nobody did. But you also have a quote here that I've never seen from James Randi, and I interviewed him uh, 15 years ago uh, okay. on, the, on this very show. But um, the quote was, um, you always have an out. In other words, I think yes. that means that, you know, if uh, because somebody said to him, are you not worried that this is going to bankrupt you if uh, if somebody wins the money, you're going to have to pay. And he said, you always have an out. Yes. And uh, that he said to Dennis Rawlins, a famous astronomer that was his friend and also a part of the same skeptical community that Randy was at the time. Uh, uh, Rawlins asked him about that. And uh, after Randy gave him that reply, uh, Rawlins also lost faith in Randy's, say, accountability for this competition. Mm. It is basically considered a scam among serious parapsychologists. Well, I, I mean, I don't know whether I can comment about about that and uh, poor James Randi is not here to to oh. comment on that uh, that um, <laughs> suggestion himself <laughs> here. But we have to say that he did do a lot to expose um, a lot of fakery, and we know that in this field, although both of us would agree because I do a program like this and you do research like you do there are things in heaven and earth that we cannot explain but equally I've come across some egregious what I would consider to be fakes or certainly people who delude themselves that they have powers so I think James Randi did a lot in his lifetime to call out such people of course, and a very, uh, say, very good work he did on that field, and all, especially some kind of fake preachers in the U.S., some uh, uh, guys that w- were faking uh, miracles, you know, to get followers and uh, to get their money and uh, power over, over their minds and such things. So Randy did a quite uh, formidable job in that respect. Mm-hmm. But, you know, as the old expression goes, you can t- uh, throw out the baby with the uh, uh, bathing water, and I felt that Randy Randy did that because in my uh, perception, these phenomena are, uh, as I said, natural and rational phenomena. They are not kind of bogus things that just are made up to to, to get power uh, uh, over people. Uh, but if someone choose to use this, uh, say, phenomena that way, of course, that is very unethical. And Randy exposed quite a lot of those people. Uh, but his, say, philosophical approach to them, I feel, uh, is quite superficial. And of course, there are those, and I've heard people say this in interviews um, over the years, um, who say that by doing what he did, to some extent, he set back serious research into into parapsychology and the paranormal, um, because, for example, there was that famous um, ruse that he came up with. He had two young magicians uh, sign up for experiments at the McDonald Laboratory for Psychical Research, um, and the two misled the researchers and the researchers went along with it and then randy came and said well actually these two people are working in league with me and it's all a fake Yes, and he also, that is one of his, say, little scams, and also he went to a laboratory in London, uh, what you just, just said was happening in the US, and uh, but another time he went with some electronic uh, equipment to a laboratory in London where they res- did research, quite serious research, on uh, bending of metal with mental powers, and he had this electronic equipment wanting to botch up the experiments. He was exposed and thrown out of the laboratory but you know uh, generally when you have magicians doing these kind of things they are somehow uh, doing their own thing and uh, uh, the American Department of Defense were doing quite a uh, se- uh, lot of serious research into this the so called Project mm. Stargate at that time which and we're going to get had- into because it's a very important part of your book 
Yes, it is. And uh, th- their conclusion about Randy was that he was a showman, uh, basically out to promote himself uh, rather than doing serious research into this field. That was uh, the Department of Defense's uh, conclusion. Mm. Well, again, I, I, I still think that he, he did do a lot to call out some people and to at least make us oh, yes, think, yes. because it is possible to be to be duped in all of this. Uh, the The book starts with Abraham Lincoln's dream. Um, And I'm going to quote from the book. Um, And this is quoting Abraham Lincoln. About 10 days ago, I retired very late. I'd been up waiting for important dispatches from the front. I could not have been long in bed when I fell into a slumber, for I was weary. I soon began to dream. There seemed to be a death-like stillness about me. And then I heard subdued sobs as if a number of people were weeping. So this all starts, if I don't have this wrong, with Abraham Lincoln very famous character from all of our histories, uh, America particularly, having what appeared to be some kind of precognitive dream? Yes, uh, and uh, if you had, uh, say, uh, repeat, um, what is called, recited the whole dream, you would, uh, it's a quite uh, eerie thing because he, he sees his, himself uh, 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 laying as a corpse and uh, there's lots of people around sobbing and uh, he asks a, a soldier uh, standing close to the corpse, what's happened? And uh, the soldier says, uh, it's the president. He was shot by an assassin. And uh, this happened uh, three days before Lincoln went to the theater and famously was shot by an assassin uh, and died from his wounds the, the, the following day. So it's, uh, it's a quite uh, hair-raising dream if you, re- you read it in, in its entirety. And, and if we are to believe those words... Um, and why shouldn't we? Well, there might be reasons why we shouldn't, but if we're to believe those words, then it's a very high profile case of somebody predicting their own future and that future not being a good future, as, as history proved. Uh, no, uh, what is typical for these phenomena, uh, regrettably, we could say that is uh, often, often uh, say, events that are emotionally uh, strongly charged that will come through and uh, of course crisis death Mm. wounds and all these kinds of things and of course a person's death is uh, often uh, at least uh, accompanied by by fear and uh, yeah Mm. well i I have no no proof that these things exist but anecdotally in my life i've certainly seen seen instances where you know bad things that have happened maybe they've happened to me and I've, in a way, been aware of them beforehand because they have a backwash through time. So I think we can agree on that. Um, we'll come back to Terry A. Simonson in Norway and his book, um, A Short History of Almost Everything Paranormal, coming soon here on The Unexplained from Talk Radio with me, Howard Hughes. Stay here. Talk Radio. The Unexplained with Howard Hughes on Talk Radio. The Unexplained with Howard Hughes brings you Terry A. Simonsen in the south of Norway and his book, A Short History of Almost Everything Paranormal. Um, why almost everything, Terry A.? Well, you know, of course, a book does not cover everything because this paranormal field is uh, enormous. And also, of course, it's a little hint to the famous book by Bill Bryson, uh, A Short (laughs) History of Nearly Everything. So I just added (laughs) paranormal, you know. Okay, no, I missed that. Yes, obviously. Uh, Yes, I know. I didn't get the Bill Bryson connection. I should have. All right. You talk about Psy, this thing that we, we investigate out there, PSI, Psi, and you talk about the big five elements and aspects of it are. And I think it's a good idea for us to list them, and you do in the book. Uh, Number Mm -hmm. one, telepathy, uh, thinking the same as somebody else. Number two, clairvoyance, uh, psychic sight, remote viewing, mental television. Three, precognition, paranormal foreknowledge, uh, Abe Lincoln being an example, premonition. Four, telekinesis, being able to move things by mental influence. And five, healing, those you think of the, the five aspects of psi, as we would call it. 
Well, they are uh, the classical main forms of Psi. And uh, of course, it's just a map, you know, but it's a useful map. And uh, the first three of the phenomena, you, you mentioned uh, the telepathy, clairvoyance and precognition, they are you often called ESP, extrasensory perception. And the two uh, others um, are it's called PK, uh, psychokinesis. So the first is uh, the first three is about transference of information, and the last two is about transference of energy. Mm, and telekinesis, I haven't, I can't. In all the years that I've been doing this program, I haven't actually met anybody who could do that. I've met people and spoken to people who said they can do it. I haven't actually seen anybody who could do it. Is telekinesis common? Uh, well, uh, I, I used to quite uh, say funny example. You move your body, don't you? And that's telekinesis in a way because you use the psychic power to move your physical body. But of course, uh, we are not speaking about that kind of telekinesis here. Uh, well, uh, it's difficult to say. Uh, the parapsychologists, they uh, choose to do um, with what is called random event generators. Uh, for instance, a machine that gives uh, red and uh, green green uh, blinks um, with a little lamp, for instance, and uh, the point for uh, the side of psychic is to somehow influence to the, the machine to come up with more uh, green uh, blinks than red blinks. And if you have a so-called even distribution uh, and uh, from the machine's part, uh, and you do thousands and thousands of experiments and you get a kind of tilt on, on, on the statistics there, then that tilt had, has to be exactly Explained. And uh, uh, Dean Radin, who is the most f famous parapsychologist today, uh, he has gone through lots of the, those studies and he concludes that this is a, uh, a real phenomenon. And uh, Dean has been working also in Bell Laboratories, a very famous laboratory in the US, uh, together with lots of Nobel Prize winners. So he's a no fool. So, uh, no, you know, I've, I've had Dean Radin yeah. on this show. He's a very, I must get him back on. He's an excellent guest. Yes, he is. Uh, in fact, I will uh, be on air with him in another show before Christmas. So, uh, yeah, he thanked well, yes. Well, uh, please, uh, please give it my night. regards. Okay, so okay. he thinks, and you think, that telekinesis does exist. I'm, I'm thinking back to James Randi here. I'm sure I saw a TV clip of a young guy, I think it was in the 1970s on a TV show, who claimed that he could move the pages of a telephone directory, a telephone book, mm -hmm. as we used to call them, which were mm -hmm. open on a table. And he was just mm -hmm. um, spreading out his palm and willing the, the pages of this directory to turn over. And mm -hmm. indeed, they did. Mm -hmm. But it appeared on subsequent investigation. And I think James Randi was part of this on this TV show. And I must look that up again sometime. But uh, that there was some kind of phenomenon involving the movement of air that was actually moving <laughs> those pages. And there was no telekinesis. And I, I guess, you know, that kind of thing does not help the study of that phenomenon, I would have thought. No, of course it does not. So you should have a laboratory series with, uh, uh, possibly with the magicians present so they can detect if there is any fraud going on. Uh, so, uh, you know, I, I, I am not into the sensationalist thing of this. Uh, I'm more into, say, what can we get, make the controls as rigorous as possible and then see what, what we get. Have you, of those five things we talked about, telepathy, mm -hmm. clairvoyance, precognition, telekinesis and healing, yes. have you seen yourself examples of these things at work? I would say I had uh, seen at work telepathy and clairvoy uh, clairvoyance and precognition and to some extent also healing, yes. And of all of those experiences, can you think of maybe one or two that would, uh, you know, would amaze my listener? <laughs> you know, uh, there can always be... Uh other explanations. So without going into detail about that, uh, I can tell a little uh, funny story. I was going to a date some years ago and uh, I was of course a bit nervous, how will that go? And uh, so, so I asked an old uh, traveler, you know, there is, is a tradition mm -hmm. ab uh, amongst travelers uh, for psychic phenomena. And I asked an old traveler, uh, gypsy or what you call them in England uh, about uh, this and he, he was known to be psychic and he said, oh yeah, yes, this will go quite well. She likes you a lot and so and so. And then he ended uh, uh, his... Um 
say kind of prediction by saying and i can tell you this woman is one meter and 64 centimeters tall uh-huh. and i said and i said huh how do you know well i don't know how i know but she is uh, and uh, say the the average height of a norwegian woman i think is one meter and 67 centimeters so he did not just come up with a number you know out of the catalog of statistics or anything like that well anyway i went to this that date and it went quite well and so and so and i couldn't of course uh, keep myself back so during the, uh, the evening i asked her <laughs> i was about to say <laughs> you, you yes. didn't ask her did you by the way i mean the yeah, first yeah, date yeah, yeah, yeah. how tall are you <laughs> casually i asked her <laughs> by the way how tall are you and she then said one meter and 64 centimeters <laughs> and did she say to you, as I suspect she might have said, um, actually, nobody's ever asked me that question before on a date? No, I, I have never asked anyone before on a date. And, about and did, you, did you tell her why you were asking it? No, I was just doing it casually in passing, you know. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, I think, I mean, listen, you, you got me convinced with that story. I think that's very good. One meter, 64 centimeters. I've no idea uh, what that is in, in British, well, what used to be British feet and inches. But, uh, but there we are. You talk a lot in the book about psychic archaeology. What is yes. that? Well, uh, some uh, some archaeologists have used psychics to, to do uh, important finds. Uh, it's not so very well known, but uh, quite serious p- persons have used that. Most famously, it was a Canadian archaeologist, Professor Norman Emerson, and he often uh, he is uh, the, the big archaeologist on uh, the First Nations people uh, archaeology in Canada. And he several times used a psychic called George McMahon, and uh, he said that in about 80% of the cases, uh, George McMullen, uh, in fact, did uh, find uh, the artifacts they sought out uh, with uh, using his psychic abilities. And uh, Norman Emerson is uh, often called the father of scientific archaeology in Canada. So his uh, testimonial about uh, about this is very interesting. And he's also written uh, several essays about psychic archaeology. So do you think that that is being used um, in Egypt at the moment? You know, the Great Pyramid, I think, has been scanned using modern technology. If I'm if I'm right about that, somebody will tell me. Um, Do you think that they're using psychics Uh, there? uh, 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 well, uh, I don't, uh, you know, it's not normal among us um, archaeologists to do that, but there were, uh, there was um, a project in the 1980s called the Alexandria Project, and there there was a guy named uh, uh, Schwartz. Uh, he used 11 psychics, and he did, in fa- fact, uh, did uh, quite important finds there. Among other things, he found the palace of Cleopatra, Cleop- Petra, uh, and that was quite uh, impressive, uh, and it was also filmed, so he uh, has documented this, and uh, he wrote a book at, about it uh, afterwards. That's astonishing. Now, you said we would talk about this, and I think we should. Project Stargate, this is America's investigation. We've talked about this with various people on this show many times, and I find it fascinating. Um, mm-hmm. the, most recently, we spoke with Russell Targ about four weeks ago, so and he's quoted in your book as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Where America for purposes of uh, prosecuting the Cold War, used or tried to use various psychic methods. And from your account of it, um, it all appeared to be, you know, pretty successful. There was somebody called Nina Kulagina um, who demonstrated telekinesis. Yes, but that she was Russian, and she could also have been uh, part of a, say, a Russian propaganda uh, act. Uh, but you can find uh, several of the videos with Nina Kulagina on on YouTube, so you can go and see for yourself and and make up your own mind about that. Uh, but as I said, she was Russian, and she could have been part of a Russian propaganda project. But uh, in the U.S., uh, they used quite a lot of uh, serious physicists doing this research and uh, they concluded I have read uh, reports uh, Russell Targ is just one of them and uh, all the reports I have read concludes that this is a very real but also very unstable phenomenon and I think from uh, my memory of reading through your book when they came to wrap all of this up 
if they really did wrap it up fully in yeah. 1995, it had been going from the 1970s. Uh, they they actually came, and you know, the, the U.S. military, the U.S. government wouldn't wouldn't I don't think have wasted money on all of this stuff for so many years, but they came to conclude that the hit rate for the remote viewing and many of those things that they used was pretty high. Yes, uh, they have uh, an evaluation by, uh, amongst others, uh, well, the, the two persons, we can get back to the other, but one of the persons uh, evaluating this was a professor in statistics, and she had made several textbooks in her field. Uh, her name is Jessica Utz, and I don't know if that's the correct, uh, but uh, U-T-T-S, uh, Utz. And she concluded that uh, there was a hit rate about uh, 35%, and that's far beyond what normal guessing would have. Uh, given here and she is very respected mm. in uh, in her field i did didn't you say in the book that uh, chance randomness would give you 17 percent and they or something like that and they were getting at best 34 percent Mm -hmm. about that you know the numbers there were different types of experience and the different protocols and so and so so but as a say general idea uh, these numbers uh, uh, we could go with them yes and what do you think it was then if they were doing remote viewing experiments, which we know they were, and they were trying to divine what was going on the other side of the, you know, the, the, the um, Berlin Wall, the Eastern Bloc in the Eastern Bloc? Um, mm -hmm. What do you think they were using? Were they tapping into this um, limitless, endless mental Internet you talk about? Yes, I, and I, as I said, for me, this is a quite natural thing. It's the nature of consciousness is to be ubiquitous, just like electromagnetism is ubiquitous throughout the universe. Also, consciousness is a part, uh, it's a basic fiber in the fabric of the universe. And uh, the, say the only question is, how aware are you of what is going there? As I used the metaphor of the internet, you have some people have a good search engine on the internet and they trained special people to do this work and uh, somehow loading down information for that uh, from that mental internet and as you said uh, the statistics uh, at least according to professor Utz, showed they were quite successful in doing so we don't have time to go into all of all of this in detail but it's a great part of your book i think you talk about Thank the you. various beliefs of various um, groups of people around the world like the sami uh, on the mm -hmm. arctic circle where you are and the Bushmen of Africa. And you say that uh, Bushmen, is, um, they have a, a collective consciousness, um, which, which is, is palpable, that you can, you know, you can, you can see and is obvious. Yes, uh, there is a, um, a quite famous American psychologist and anthropologist called Bradford Keeney, his professor in Louisiana, mm. and he has been initiated into their uh, century and century and century old tradition of the Bushmen. And he says that in uh, some of the most absorbing experiences of this sphere, uh, the Bushmen call it classroom. They download information about the ancestors, about uh, say different hunting techniques about plant medical plants and everything so it's part of the collective memory that is available if you just tune into it and as i said this is professor bradford keeney and he's written about 20 books in psychology and is quite respected in his field so we can just cannot say this just bogus and and any vivid imagination this I think this quotation is from Bradford Keeney. Um, I, I wrote this one down from the book. Uh, During this foray into some exotic paranormal forests, we have seen that qualified anthropologists have had their eyebrows raised and their jaws dropped in encounters with primeval cultures more open than our own to the enigmatic, enigmatic world of psi phenomena. In other words, there are cultures around this world, and we know this, who could teach us a thing or two about all of this. Yes, I think uh, it's, it's we have been forgetful, uh, and that is what I, also what I do in my book. I, I, I show that, say, the great German philosophers of uh, the 18th century and 19th century, uh, early 19th century, uh, Hegel, for instance, uh, even Kant, uh, Schopenhauer, they all believed in this phenomena. Uh, they uh, not to say believe in, because then you make it kind of religious issue. Uh, it's they took it for granted that these phenomena. Uh, 
uh, was, uh, say, uh, objectively real and part of uh, consciousness. It's just uh, that it have become this uh, reductionist materialist dogma uh, that's part of, uh, say, modern science um, after Newton and the Newtonian science that somehow excluded uh, these phenomena. And that is an important point for me because if you have a model, that uh, model of consciousness, ex explanatory model that excludes those phenom uh, phenomena from the outside, well, it's no wonder you don't find them. <laughs> so, uh, and uh, earlier European tradition do not have a uh, model that excludes uh, these phenomena. And uh, indigenous people all over the world do not have models excluding those phenomena. And also within quantum physics, there are some of the uh, physicists, for instance, uh, famous Nobel Prize winner in uh, Cambridge, Professor Brian Josephson, his model of consciousness do not exclude these phenomena. And I quote also Josephson in my book, and he has said these are very real phenomena, and he claims to have them demonstrated also. So um, the might of the model is really the problem here. If you have a model excluding those phenomena, you've got a problem. If you open to other kind of models, uh, say based on quantum physics, for, in uh, for instance, or string theory, mm -hmm. uh, then you could much more easily include those phenomena in your science. And it's all in the book. Terry, uh, I want to talk next, if it's okay with you, in the next segment, um, about some Nor specifically Norwegian paranormal stories that you've got in here that I really like. There was a, a poltergeist case I'd like to get into, if that's possible. And you also yes. talk about um, a, a psychic uh, from Norway as well. So we'll do that next with Terry A. Simonson, and his book is A Short History of Almost Everything Paranormal. This is The Unexplained. Online, on DAB, and on the Talk Radio app. Talk Radio. Across the UK, online, on DAB, and on your smart speaker, Dan Wooden, on Talk Radio. We'll have the breaking news of the day and the biggest newsmakers, combined with feisty political debate and Davis guests. Dan Wooden, Monday to Thursday afternoons, from 4, on Talk Radio. The Unexplained, with Howard Hughes, on Talk Radio. The Unexplained, back to southern Norway. Terry A. Simonsen, and we're talking about paranormality. We're going to get some Norwegian stories in the book, and I'm glad that you, um, Terry A., included uh, some stories from, from your own land here. Um, you, you talk a lot about a, a guy I'd never heard about, um, a psychic called uh, Jordalf Gerstad, I think is his name, the, the Snarsam, you can tell me what, they call him the Snarsa man. The Snorsa man, yes. Snorsa man. He, yes, this old guy, he's living in uh, north in Norway in a little village called Snorsa, and therefore they call him the Snorsa man. <clears throat> and this is a guy you say um, he predicted the assassination, it is reported, of JFK uh, just before it happened. Uh, he got a frightful vision of uh, JFK being killed, and he told this uh, to, to several friends before d to have them as witness. And uh, some days after, it uh, in fact occurred. So, yes. Now, did he, I don't know if he was well known, it, 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 that's a long time ago, if he was already well known as a, a psychic there, but did he try and tell anybody about this? I mean, anybody yes. in America? Uh, no, he did not. Uh, and of course, uh, usually if you see a plane crashing, you don't call uh, for your inner vision. You don't call, uh, say, uh, <laughs> KLM or British Airways to tell what you've seen. You know, they will declare you, you insane right away uh, and possibly with good reason. Most of the case. <laughs> right. So, so, so uh, this, is, this is the kind of stuff he does. Um, and how do you think he is doing that? Is he again tapping into that that mental Internet? That is what I think, yes. Uh, I, I have a chapter in my book also about that, that uh, our perception of time is probably, uh, you know, we have limited capacity in our, say, day-to-day -day ego. And um, I, I compare to if you go on a railway and you go to, say, you are going on the train in London and want to go to Scotland. Okay, you are probably going through Manchester. And when you enter the train in London, of course, Manchester is already there. Yeah but you have not arrived yet. You need time to come there. And I think also uh, we somehow organize uh, uh, the events in a linear time. Uh, Einstein famously said that the only reason there is time is that so that 
not everything should happen at once <laughs> because that would be overwhelming and confusing but uh, th uh, in fact also the american association for the advancement of science had done some serious uh, serious experiments with uh, uh, retro causality and uh, the relativity of time so uh, i think say our common sense uh, and day-to-day -day consciousness uh, uh, operates with linear time but basically in altered state of consciousness i think it's possible to somehow uh, expand and, and leave the linear time and get a more, say, um, what is called, uh, what, what would be the English, English word, uh, yeah, say, eternity perspective on this, uh, to be lifted out from uh, your train wagon, getting up in a helicopter and see uh, the totality of the railway from above. Right. So if you went up in that helicopter and you looked down from... I don't know, five, ten thousand feet, you yes. would see, you'd be able to look all the way back down the track and see where you'd been, but you'd also be able to see the, the stations ahead of you. And that exactly. speaks to the fact that, as I've always kind of thought, that the past exists, the future already exists, and our present, of course, exists because we're in it, mm -hmm. and they all have equal value. Yes, that is uh, very valid. That is called uh, eternalism, and that's a very valid uh, opinion uh, that uh, several physicists uh, uh, share that uh, opinion. Uh, it's also called block time, or the, uh, the B theory of time. It was a philosopher about uh, the early 19th and uh, 20th century, uh, MacTaggart. He um, wrote a book called The Unreal uh, Unreality of Time, and he defends that position. Um, we talked, and we'll, we'll just quickly cover this, and then we'll move on to something else. But uh, Jordalf Gerstad, the, the psychic, the Snorsa man. Yes. Um, is he still alive? Yes, he is ninety-three years old. Wow. And he yes, and he visited the, the Pope last year. Well, okay. Well, <laughs> you know, I've never heard of him, and I'm sure my listeners, well, my listener may well know of him, but I don't think they will. Um, but it would be more useful, wouldn't it, if you were able to go to him, for example? And this is a frivolous example, but if I was able to go with him and say, go to him, and say, um, Jordaf, could you tell me the winning six lottery numbers for next week? Please, can you ah. see those? If you know, he can't do this to yes. order, can he? That's the problem. Uh, well, uh, someone have uh, tested him, not on Lotto, but uh, uh, there's a famous lawyer in Norway. He's called Kato Schutz, and he uh, has uh, did, uh, did a test. He drew a card from a pack, and not knowing the card himself, he asked uh, uh, Yasta, can you tell me which card I just drew? And he had controlled uh, the pack and controlled the card, and uh, Yasta did not see when he drew it. Uh, and it was totally hidden. Uh, and uh, even so Yasta could tell the number on that card. He usually don't go into these party uh, games. He is a very serious man, you know, feeling he's got a gift from God. He's usually working, uh, mostly working as a healer uh, and also helping the police getting, uh, finding lost persons and also helping the Red Cross uh, when there has been avalanches and people have disappeared uh, trying to uh, find them. And he has uh, succeeded on several cases. So that is what he's really into. I don't know uh, what he he would answer probably he'd just laugh or i don't know if he would be able to do it also because that is a very precise information uh, uh it's uh, these kind of things you know you can uh, the information very often appears as pictures as you get in your dream and they will not come with uh, statistics mm -hmm. and point zero two three and you know so if you ask to be too specific i think that could be difficult i, I compare often if you see a bird uh, approach Approaching some uh, several hundred meters coming. You cannot see if that is a seagull or a crow or whatever uh, uh, because it's far away. But you see something flapping the wings over there. And that is some, uh, I think it is comparable to a, a psychic. You get some impression, a general impression, what is approaching you. But to, uh, to say, describe the wings in the detail and uh, every feather on the bird, that is uh, close to impossible, I would say. 
There is a great poltergeist story, a Norwegian story, uh, from 2010 that, again, I, I've never heard of. Uh, this is a kindergarten called Lalem, I think, in yes. Gudbrandsdalen. Um, yes. Between April the 26th and June the 15th, 2010, all 15 employees witnessed diverse objects, cups, mugs, stones, jars, flying through the rooms. Sometimes these items seem to appear out of thin air. In addition, doors opened and closed by themselves. Figures were drawn with crayons moved by nobody's hand, no human hand, that is. Feathers used for decoration organized themselves into specific patterns, and so on. More than 90 seemingly inexplicable episodes occurred there, and interestingly enough, many of these events were observed by two or three adults simultaneously. Uh, and these events there were investigated by a parapsychologist, uh, Kiel Flekoy. Yes, but he is, uh, in fact, not a pair of psychologists. He is a professor in very ordinary psychology, and is used uh, very often by courtrooms and official instances in Norway to make reports. So he's a, a, a very serious guy, this. Okay, uh, and these were very serious events. Oh, yes. Uh, quite uh, dramatic events. So I, I, I cannot go into all of it in my book because it's, uh, as I said, it was 90, 90 different, uh, about 90 different things. But, you know, heavy objects moving around and uh, sounds and, uh, uh, as I said, uh, uh, crayons uh, <laughs> yeah, making drawings by themselves. And, uh, quite si and, and uh, some of those phenomena uh, uh, were witnessed about, uh, up to uh, 20 people at the same time. And uh, some of the parents were at first very skeptical about this because they thought uh, some uh, you know people were going crazy in the uh, uh, in the staff or uh, they were being fooled by some tricks or something like that but uh, uh, three of uh, the skeptical parents uh, also in the end ended up uh, with seeing those phenomena happening right before their eyes so it's quite well documented this uh, and again uh, if you have a model that says these things cannot happen okay then you have a problem you must say those are crazy or they, are, they have taken LSD or whatever, you know. But if you have a model of consciousness that say that somehow and some uh, in some way and sometimes consciousness will kick in uh, also uh, influencing the material world, well, then these phenomena are not that problematic, at least. There's a, a quote from the activities that went on there, the activity. Uh, and I think this was from um, Kiel Flecoy's um, report. Uh, quotes, right after we, the skeptic and two other people, had entered the eastern part of the kindergarten's living room, we heard a kind of snap from the ceiling. Then appeared a felt-tip pen of the sort that we normally call a marker pen. It came at high speed from the ceiling and landed in a window facing south. The marker landed on the window sill and stopped as if it had landed in glue. There it lay motionless. I picked it up and put it in my pocket. Strange events. Yes, it is. Uh, uh, also, um, in, I mentioned that uh, just in passing in the book, Kjell Flecker, uh, the professor in psychology investigating these phenomena, he has a brother that is a professor in physics at the university in Oslo, and he was also involved in uh, evaluating and assessing these phenomena. And uh, together they reached the conclusion that uh, most likely uh, these phenomena uh, were physically real. It was not just people lying or wanting the 15 minutes and the line right or something like that it's just a kind of unexplained it's unmapped uh, terrain to put it that way and th was, was this um it was a working kindergarten wasn't it oh yes it was so how did the children and manage with that if, if <laughs> things like that were happening around the children were they ter you know as a child i would have been terrified Yes, uh, they were quite perturbed at, at what I heard. Uh, and also, of course, the grown-up people, uh, probably children, are, uh, tend to be more accepting, you know, because mm. they don't have that fixed opinion what the world is supposed to be. But uh, at least some of uh, the grown-ups, uh, the staff, were quite uh, frightened by these phenomena. And all of this happened 10 years ago. So is it all quiet now in the good brand Stalin? Uh, um, from the last report I heard, it's all quiet uh, this day. Uh, as I write, uh, uh, this day, uh, only the sound and noises that uh, should be in kindergarten are heard. What a strange thing, and how terrifying for the people who experience that. So the final conclusion of this very Norwegian story, um, which I don't think was reported by the newspapers here in the UK, it should have been, um, is that these events were truly unexplainable. There was no rational 
scientific explanation of what happened. Well, the report of the psychology professor um, say um, play the ball on to to, to future science. Uh, so, say the objective reality of the phenomenon was so somehow um, what we say documented, uh, but. Uh, the explanatory model was not launched. So that is the problem with these phenomena. Already Freud said that that uh, probably if you investigate these phenomena, you will find that most of them are real, but to reach uh, an explanatory model that everybody can agree of, uh, about, that is a problem. And if I must say, uh, the most prestigious psychological journal in the world is often considered to be uh, uh, the American Psychologist, which is uh, released by APA, the American Psychological Association. And two years ago, in the May issue uh, to, uh, in 2018, uh, Professor Etzel Cardenia of, uh, of Lund University in Sweden uh, wrote an article for them. And he also says the same, that uh, going through about uh, nearly all research done in the field, he concludes, yes, those phenomena are real, but no, we have not reached an explanatory model that we can agree about. <laughs> well, when we do, you and I have to have another conversation. We've only scratched the surface. It is uh, a remarkable book that I think would make a great Christmas present for somebody. Uh, the book is called A Short History of Almost Everything Paranormal. It's by Tarie G. Simonson. And who publishes this? Uh, it's Watkins Publishing in London. It's uh, England's uh, oldest mm. uh, publisher for mind, body, spirit literature. It was uh, started in 1893, and it's also portrayed indirectly in the, the Harry Potter books. Right? Oh, is it? How, yes, it is. How, how so? Uh, oh, yes, of course uh, it is. Yes, and Watkins appears in the Harry Potter books. Yes. Yeah, yeah, so no. the, I think some of uh, the Hogwarts pupils buy uh, the uh, curriculum books there. <laughs> yes, Watkins, also a famous uh, store selling books of this kind. A remarkable place, very close to Covent Garden in London. Uh, it used to be yes. very close to a place where I used to work. Tarje, we're totally out of time. Thank you so much. Thank you, Howard. Tarje Simonsen in uh, Norway. <sighs> fascinating conversation don't you think more great guests in the pipeline here on the unexplained thank you very much for being part of my show thank you to john for doing the technical production tonight thank you to reese for helping me get this all together and above all thank you to you for being part of all of this uh, paul ross is next here on talk radio so till next we meet hopefully in one week from now my name is howard useless has been the unexplained on the radio and please stay safe stay calm and above all please stay in touch thank you very much take care bye bye talk radio Talk Radio across the UK, online, on DAB, and on your smart speaker. The Unexplained with Howard Hughes on Talk Radio. Talk Radio. Talk Radio.